。大家晚上好，欢迎大家来到国际培训大咖五十谈，我是郭立民。上一期我们非常荣幸的请到了。国际上非常著名的组织发展领域和学习型组织领域非常著名的 Karen 沃特金斯教授，凯伦沃特金斯教授 ，Care Doctor Karen Watkins， 也是乔治亚大学的这个系主任，给我们讲授了很多很多非常重要的知识点，包括什么是组织发展，人力资源发展到底是什么，以及组织发展它包含哪些内容，啊，组织发展是否适合于我们发展中中国家等等等等。以及呢，我们还请他给我们讲解了什么是无意间学习，以及呢，学习型组织到底怎么样去评判，也就是他的著名的 DLOQ， 叫 Dimension of Learning Organization Questionnaire DLOQ 量表。那么这个量表呢，是他们和他和几位啊非常资深的研究者、学者、教授们多年研究和实践的结果的结晶。上一期呢，我们确实从沃特金斯教授那里学到了很多很多的东西啊，还有呢，无意间学习，我刚才提到的，也非常的令我们耳目一新。其实每天我们都在学习很多新的知识，只不过我们一没有意识到而已。所以对于组织来讲，对于个人发展来讲，都是非常重要的。感谢沃特金斯教授几十年以来在这个领域里面所做的贡献，我们希望期待以后向您学习更多。感谢。那么今天我们又一次非常荣幸的请到了另外一位嘉宾，也是非常非常的资深，而且这位嘉宾非常的有特色。他的特色是什么呢？他的特色就是 painting、drawing， 是画画，是绘画。首先，他是一位非常非常资深的绩效改进方面的专家和资深的咨询顾问。并且呢，在这个领域里面呢，也是有四十年左右时间的这个经验了。那么他的最擅长，他之所以非常非常的成功，是因为他掌握了一个非常高效的沟通的技巧。我在这里想跟大家说一下，沟通技巧是我们除了专业技能之外，一个人一生职业生涯当中几乎几乎是最为重要的啊，这个通用的技巧，这通用的技能了。而且这个非技能呢，对我们职业生涯的发展呢，非常非常的重要。我们都知道，图形可以让我们意图胜千言。那么，如何在我们的工作当中，在我们向领导和向同事进行汇报、进行分享的过程当中，在我们进行讲课、授课的培训过程当中，以及在我们进行工作坊等等各种场合下，如何用一张图来清晰的、简洁的？直达意的表达我们的意图呢？表达我们所要表达的意思呢？这样的技巧对我们太重要了。所以今天晚上的访谈将会非常非常有特色。好，闲话少叙，那我们就下面隆重有请林科尼，林恩科尼女士。Hi, Lynn. How are you? I'm fine, George. Thank you for inviting me to join you. The pleasure is ours, and also the gratitude is ours. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be on the Training Master Series. Well, I I really appreciate it. It's very nice to stay involved and to know that I'm talking to colleagues around the globe. Right, I think right. Very the exciting thing that has developed since I was first started my career. And、uh, I really appreciate you finding time to among your busy schedules, and、uh, and also that um, that um, um, we are very eager to learn from everyone.、Uh, so, but before that, will you please, for audience, will you please,、uh, for our audience,、uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us where you grew up, where you went to college, what、uh, do you studied, and tell us where you work and live now. <clears throat> My name is Lynn Carney, and I was、uh, raised in Los Alamos, New Mexico, which is a a large、uh, state in、uh, the southwest of the United States. It is fairly sparsely populated, 
And Los Alamos is a nuclear research laboratory that was set up by the US government with cooperation from um, various um, European countries at the time of the Second World War. Um, that's where the atomic bomb was uh, was developed and uh, subsequently other nuclear weapons have been developed there and also um, nuclear medicine of various kinds, uh, lasers, um, a lot of technology has come out of that initial pioneer effort. Los Alamos is still up there on the side of a volcano, uh, but when I was a child, um, the town was um, surrounded by security gates. And so we never needed to lock our doors. We could just run around and, and uh, visit um, each other's houses, uh, climb into the canyons and explore Indian ruins, climb up into the nearby small mountains. And so it was really an ideal childhood. Exactly. Uh, very very interesting and well-educated um, neighbors. Um, so we all grew up in uh, surrounded by a rather international community of people who were highly educated and uh, all of the men had a technical science background. Many of them had more than one PhD and uh, many of them had married women who had liberal arts backgrounds, um, sometimes the arts, sometimes music, sometimes literature, a few of them um, industrial topics. But it was, it was a large and interesting community and uh, I was privileged to be there. We had a very good school system. But um, when I reached my teens, I chose not to go to college. I wanted to go out into the world and earn my own living and be independent. That was very important to me. And I wanted to learn more about the world before I chose a career. I was also concerned that my parents had six children. Uh, I was the oldest on a not very big salary. Scientists did not make a lot of money. They sort of got the same wage as an assistant professor, I would say. And I didn't think I should go to college with all the time and energy and expense for my parents when all these other children were behind me and that I should find my own way and pick strategically. So, I started trying out jobs and looking at what was of interest. Um, and when I came back, um, well, during that time, I worked several jobs. I got married. I went into the Peace Corps in Africa with my husband. We went to West Africa. Whatever I did, I always seemed to wind up teaching. Uh, I was sent in community development to West Africa, both of us were, but I wound up teaching. I wound up teaching in a Muslim missionary secondary school, and I wound up um, teaching, writing and teaching an adult literacy program. And uh, so when I came back to the U.S., I founded a stopgap job in a bank and was right away asked to teach, to do a teller training program for the bank. And so I decided that would be my career was training because it was useful, it was valuable, and it contained everything that I wanted. But there wasn't really much in the line of degrees for that at the time, which was the 60s. And uh, so I decided I would learn by studying books, by acting, asking people who are good at it, and uh, trying out what I was learning in my actual job. So that continued to be my approach, and that is still, still my approach. I never formally went to university, although I have been a guest speaker at various colleges 
And I have written, I've published five books in training and human performance improvement. Three of them I co-authored with the colleagues at ISBI. And uh, those are now being used in graduate programs in our field. Now I am retired. I have moved, although I've spent most of my career in Oakland, New Mexico, which is near San Francisco. I am now retired with my husband. I moved back to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I do landscape paintings of the American Southwest. So that is the full arc of my career. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, couple of points. Uh, New Mexico, uh, uh, Los Alamos is very well known for uh, the, El uh, the laboratory. Uh, Los, Los Alamos uh, Laboratory, when I studied uh, the, well, read the, uh, uh, the Manhattan Project and how it uh, ended World War II, it made a huge contribution to, the, uh, to that effort during, the, during that time. So it is still, and also I learned that uh, Robert Ganet before, I mean, in his early 80s, he's still doing some, you know, naive events of instruction work. Guess where? <laughs> <laughs> Los oh, almost a laboratory. <laughs> I didn't know that. So thank there's you. A, right. There's a there's a book called The, the Legacy of Robert Ganet, uh, uh -huh. written by uh, Rita Ricci. And uh, in, in one of the chapters, and I read he was in her early 80s, he was still conducting consulting projects for the for the lab. So it's a huge compound, it's a huge Yes. Uh, establishment in in the United in the Southwest United States, and uh, I'm I'm so I'm, I'm envious about your little uh, your childhood and you know secured gate and nobody locked their door is such a safe safe environment for kids and the heaven for kids. So you had an ideal childhood. <laughs> it's true. We, and all we, the round people, most of them are PhDs <laughs> and wow. liberal artists. <laughs> Yeah, it's true that it was a, that was unusual. I didn't realize until I left home and started right. my own way in the world that right. not everybody had everyday conversations on that same level as my parents, friends, no. and neighbors. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, but, exactly, exactly. Like and Oakland to San Francisco, I mean, there's just an, I mean, Oakland is such a beautiful city. I mean, ne next to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. just, you have been there? Oh yeah, oh yeah, many, many, many couple of times. I have a friend living in uh, Oakland and, and then they move around, you know, around the Bay Area, they move around. So Oakland is Northeast and so anyway is, um, um, so I have still have relatives uh, around the, uh, I mean, everybody probably has a relative around the Bay Area from China. <laughs> and technology, no doubt. You oh, bet, you bet. You like to know? You bet. Uh, about so most of our um, our question will be around uh, visual storytelling, visual communications, because that is your. Um, I mean, uh, from what your uh, from your career path, we have learned that you, even though you didn't go to the normal universe, I mean the normal path like everybody you know, go to goes to university, that is a successful, a very good, excellent example of lifelong learning. What I want yes. to say is uh, you, you don't have to go to university, but you can never stop reading because reading is what helps and uh, help you grow and converse with the masters and with the masterminds. So, um, so Lynn, tell us what is, a uh, what is a visual storytelling? Okay, I will, I would like to, would you pass the control to me yes. so that I can share my screen? You bet. And I would like to exemplify. Um, you bet. You bet. Okay. Oh, it says I'm uh, screen you, sharing now. Right. You 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 have the right to. Uh, okay. You have enabled you before we started. So. Okay. So, can you see this visual aid now? Yes. In visual storytelling, I I want to briefly define uh, what I mean by visual and what I mean by storytelling. So via visual, it's, it's something you can look at. So it, it is not only pictures, it's also words. It may be just geometric shapes. It may be areas of color, uh, videos, um, 
things can be still, they can be animated. It's just anything that your eyes take in and notice. Right. Now, by storytelling, uh, what, do I, what do I mean by a story? It's a sequence of related events that mm -hmm. matter. So it, it would be an, a narrative, something you can tell, mm -hmm. or you could show in a series of pictures, or both. Mm -hmm. And I believe you've had Ruth Clark speak in this series, and I expect she probably um, she probably mentioned that when we take in information to understand and to store it so we remember, we have two channels that operate. They are both the visual channel and the auditory channel. So spoken information and, um, and um, sorry, visual, the scene information are collected by the brain and we have something called dual encoding. We encode both of those in our brains. And so when you have both working together, then it's a much stronger connection. People are better able to understand and remember. And that's one of my, uh, one of my chief reasons for approaching things visually is that it helps people to understand quickly and remember something that they need to know. So I have a list here of things. Um, so a story can be the process of how you do something, which is often the burden of our training for people. As first you do this, first the leads are generated, then you call the lead and qualify them, then you convert it to an opportunity. This is essentially a story. It can be any action toward a goal. So I put those two together and what you see up here is a visual story. Mm -hmm. a uh, series of pictures that tell the story of how something is done. So how, now how I use them in my training career and in my performance improvement career when we're moving beyond training, I use them to, te to teach tasks and concepts like the example I just showed. I may use it to analyze or show processes I may use it to introduce initiatives. I can use it to communicate. I, I can, I say I do it, but I help the organization do it uh, to communicate the culture, to draw people out, to tell their stories. I use it also to, uh, to foster collaboration, to get people to work together on problem solving or planning or implementation and to engage people in strategy development. So what I'm, I'm sort of going on into sort of how does, how does visual storytelling work and why do we need it? So what I'm going to do is give examples of most of those things and uh, talk about it a little bit and show. So does that work for you, George? Yes, yes. And uh, so it is always amazing how powerful, I mean, the amount of message that carries, a picture carries is how powerful it is, you know, and the amount of, uh, uh, a picture carries a lot more information, a lot more messages than simple words, most of the times. And I learned that most of the people are visual learners instead of uh, auditory learners. And uh, yes, in, uh, in my conversation with uh, Ruth Clark, she did mention that visual, I mean, uh, we, we, we did mention that because she published a couple books on that and, uh, and uh, about, uh, graphics in learning and how using graphics to assist the learning, assist the, the, the process of learning transfer and the encoding process from short-term to long-term memories. So she did mention uh, from many, many angles and she published a book about it. So um, 
uh, as to come to uh, how does it work and why we need it in our training programs? I just want to okay. hear from you. Yes. Okay, so in our training programs, we are often teaching concepts. Mm -hmm. um, we are teaching people, well, we have to analyze procedures ourselves and then we have to pass it on to other people. Um, often, if an organization needs to introduce a new initiative, they will turn to training people to how do we communicate this, how do we make people familiar with it and accept it, right, and so on. So I'm going to go, I'm going to show some examples of all of these. I want to look at uh, teaching concepts. So here's a couple of, here's some concepts in human performance improvement, sort of our field. And here are a, a few concepts that I find people, I, I taught in the ISPI Institute. And I found that some concepts that people had a hard time grasping to begin with is what is performance? And they tended to confuse it with activity. Like performance is, they think is answer, uh, for a customer service rep is answering the phone. Well, no, that's not performance. That's only action. Performance is the activity plus the result. So the result then would be the customer gets the information they need and doesn't have to call back. So only taken together are they performance. The other, another thing that people struggle with is there's four levels of performance. First of all, there's the worker or the team, and we have to look at their performance and improve it. But there's also the work, the processes, the things that flow from one person to the next and from one work unit to the next and from one department to the next. And that also has its own performance rules and tools. Uh, because if the task, if the process, what we call process, what is not, if it's not well designed, then the workers can work themselves into a sweat, but not get good results for the customer because the process is broken. Um, the next level is the workplace, the organization itself. And uh, that involves things like the setting where people work. If they need something where they can spread out their work to look at it, um, and that they have only a teeny little cupboard, then they're not going to be able to perform very well, no matter how much you train them. Uh, then there is the world itself. If the organization is not aligned with the markets and the world around them and compliant with government regulations and so on, they will not function well. I'm sorry, I get sucked in. I start to teach the concept. Please, but please. This this is what is the visual helps people understand these things. And it also helps them remember because these little icons are very simple, but they come to mind again quickly. So how do you, uh, how can you improve performance? Well, you can, since it's both activity and results, you can either lower the cost of the activity such as uh, with the banks, uh, they when they put the automatic teller machine in the wall so people could come and make their deposits or withdrawals, that cost a lot less than training and putting a teller at a window and paying them the, the salary and so on. Um, so they, or you can raise the value of the result. Now for the customer, if being able to put your money in the bank and take it out when you need it, it is valuable to them to be able to walk up, not have to walk, wait in a line and to do it at any time of the night or day. So it also increased the value of the result for the customer to put the automatic teller machine in. So this is, this teaches a number of fairly complex concepts in a compact and memorable way. 
Um, he, here is one I did for a colleague who is in our field, and she wanted her clients to clients see that there is more to training than just taking people into a classroom. So the message here is training is not what you think. It's moving people from understanding to action, not just putting knowledge in their heads. It's a change in results. So it can be done with a class. It can be done with a YouTube. It can be done by Google. It can be done by observation, by somebody giving a person feedback on how they are doing, by asking a coworker how to do things. All of these are ways that learning can happen. And that's what the client really needs. What they really need is not necessarily to uh, haul everyone into a classroom. Okay, well, that's enough about concepts. Um, there's also teaching cat tasks. And here, here is a piece uh, from the first story visual that I showed where the main task goes across the top uh, for the sales process. And it's not important to look at all the details here, but it's a general mm -hmm. concept. The main flow of the task goes across the top. Mm -hmm. And then with the, oh, there's this step to validate the data collected. So mm -hmm. this, this is a sub loop that the, that the person must do, the employee must do as part of the large one. So then we move to the next step, and then there's another task loop that they have to perform in order to move to the next step. Now, the way this was used um, was I did it large on paper. They put it up in the classroom. And then as the work, as the course continued, as people learned this task, uh, the instructor could show what it looked like and where they were in the process because it was so it was complex enough that people would become confused about where they were in the process as they were learning all these steps. Mm -hmm. This could be done with a um, with a prezi where you can uh, you could do this online and the prezi could zoom in on these various little pieces so it could perform the same function even if people are not in the classroom able to see it. Okay. Okay. Um, this is so, so interesting. So I, all, I can also be used to teach tasks and knowledge. I like this. This is a book for trainers. Um, it's a comic book, an action hero comic book for trainers about the law that governs whether they can use um, uh, printed or filmed material in their training, under what circumstances they can and what circumstances they can't. And this is um, Tales from the Public Domain. And... Uh, what is fair use? There is a law that governs what is fair use of previously printed or copyrighted material. And so people would tend to go asleep in trying to read detailed legal documents about this, um, or they would become confused and distracted or bored. And so, if they even if they read this information that they needed to have, not everyone had the discipline and the ability to keep a lot of abstract ideas in their brain at the same time. So this turned it into a story, a visual story. And we have this character, in this case, a woman who's a, a, both a lawyer and a filmmaker. And she goes through inside this comic book showing what you can do and what you can't do with dramatic characters 
getting into trouble or staying out of trouble. Um, I saw a brilliant one that I wish I could, I could still find the author at an ISBI conference. He did a session on the use of comics for, mm -hmm. um, for safety regulations. And uh, he did a series of SWAT team comics mm -hmm. on people who ignored the safety regulations on the factory floor and became electrocuted or didn't drive the trucks right and so on with um, all of these medical characters who'd swoop in and rescue the victim. It was very good. And people really learned the safety regulations this way. You bet. They learned you very bet. well. Okay, and uh, by the way, I, I have uh, in the handout I sent you, uh, George, did you see? Yeah. That there was an attachment? Okay, there's a link under it mm -hmm. uh, to this comic book. So anyone who gets this can, um, let's see, the link in the job aid I sent you has a link to these slides on Dropbox, <clears throat> this same document. So this link to the comic book is in the document if you download it from my Dropbox. It has several links that will take you to nice resources. Right, right. So I also use it to analyze or show processes. Here was from an accounting department that um, we took uh, we redesigned their workflow. And mm -hmm. then uh, when we had, uh, when we were to communicate the new workflows, uh, I was thinking, let's see, the, uh, the executives have already approved the workflows with the, with the standard workflow chart, you know, the boxes and arrows that show how the work is going to go. But uh, I think that the people on the floor are going to go to sleep if we show them boxes and charts with arrows. Right. And so I want to show them what is really happening. Right. So I drew what was going on inside them. And by the way, you notice this is different layers within the chart. Right. So this is different departments. Lockbox was a computer program. Cash entry was a data entry function. RMS processing, RMS was the system. So this was what the system was doing. The revenue management team was doing all these things as stuff came in from lockbox cash entry and the RMS system. Mm -hmm. So they would move the work forward. And as they did things, it would then go into other parts of the computer programs. And this showed how the whole flow worked so that people understood what they were doing and why it was important. And before, we t before I used this in the training, I ran it by the executives because this was a little unconventional and I wanted them not to be surprised that I was going to use this in the training. Mm -hmm. So they looked at this and then they said, oh, is that what we're doing? So they, even though they had reviewed everything and approved right. everything, they didn't understand the boxes and the arrows either. Right. And what I learned from this is that what you think you have told people or what you think you have showed people is not necessarily what they have received. So pictures doesn't, don't just help the, the workers, they also help the executive workers. Okay, so how do I create something like this? Right. Well, I get somebody who knows the work process. And um, by the way, the, the complex visuals that I showed you of the, uh, the sales process, uh -huh. this is my actual notes from working with the, the trainer and the two of the supervisors from the sales teams on how do you do this? You know, what, what are the steps? And so I use sticky notes and put it out and say, is this what happens? Oh, is this before this? 
oh, all these things happen at once. And so we lay them out until they say, yes, that's how it works. And then I go and create a picture like this one. Okay, I've also used it. George, is this good? Is this what yes, should... yes, yes. I'm, I'm so much into it. I forgot I'm, at, uh, <laughs> I'm in the course of an interview. I forgot to ask questions. I'm following. That's, that's all right. You, uh, I'm the, fully drawn. The, this, is, um, this is a long answer to one short question, which please. is how do we use it and why? Right, yeah. right. please. Okay, so when you introduce, when an organization in, introduces a new initiative that will right. uh, inf affect a lot of people, they want to introduce the initiative to the organization. Right. And how do you do that? Right. Well, um, I had an organization came to me, a client, that uh, were trying to introduce talent management to their organization. And uh, the fellow in charge of talent management was going around and showing um, standards bullet point slides to members of the organization, trying to engage them and get them to do their part of what was needed to get talent management um, put together, uh, identifying the competencies and the creating talent profiles and uh, doing succession planning and uh, linking it to compensation and all of these other things. And they were, they were listening politely, but you could tell they were going, please let this man stop talking so I can go back and do my real job. And so... Most of the I time, we think about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat down with them and I said, okay, who are your audiences? Yeah, who, who are the people you need to engage? <clears throat> and we identified three. They were the employees, the people who were actually doing the frontline workers. They were their managers and they were the executives. So I put the whole thing in the competitive landscape, uh, saying, what are you, what are we trying, why are we doing this? Because we have a lot of competition and uh, the customers are not sure who they can trust and uh, the competitors are out to recruit our good people and we need to hold on to them and we can no longer rest on our past glory we must uh, really work with our people to engage our customers. And for that, we need to develop the, work the workforce of the future. So I set it up so that we were going to tell a story. This is, I call a journey map. We're going to take these three audiences on a journey. And we start by getting each audience to say something that is troubling them, a problem that they personally need to solve. So the, the executive wants to know, how can we compete in the future? And the manager's frustrated because we don't have the right talent in the right jobs in order to meet our goals. And we don't even know the capabilities of the people that we've got. And then the employee is saying, I, I, my road to development is is a maze, it's confusing. I have no clear path, I have no clear goals. So then um, each of these colored spots is a little episode, a little way station along the road. The first stage is to identify the count competencies and the talent profiles. And so I make the employee, the manager, and the executives the hero of the story. They're doing the talking. And then talent management just shows up and says, oh, would this help with the thing that they want to provide? And so we move on through the journey each time with people saying sort of how this is solving their problems until we finally come around to 
the goal, which is the customers are trusting that we that this company can deliver. The executives say our our talent is a big competitive advantage. And the manager is saying, I have people with the talents I need. We're meeting our goals. And the employee is saying, I am the right person in the right job. And I, my future is with, and then the name of the company. One thing I found out in gathering the information and talking to people was most of the employees some of the managers and the executives, they had no clue what talent management actually was. Mm -hmm. So I put this mandala in the center, which asks, what is talent management? And then it draws little vignettes of what each of the pieces are. Mm -hmm. So you start with job design and where th now what's important here is not that that the, the that you as the training people can read all the words on this thing it's that you get the idea right. of how we go about doing it and if if you're interested you can download this with the yeah. set of slides mm -hmm. uh, actually it's not a set of slides it's a pdf right so so that i find sending slides is a chancy business the, the format blows out as it moves between platforms. So right, it does, yeah. it does. Okay, so I also use it to, um, to help an organization communicate culture. Mm -hmm. And the example I want to show you here is from an NGO, a non-governmental organization. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was a CARE International that bring, um, provides famine relief and helps set up refugee camps and, mm -hmm. and does a great deal to help people in need. Uh, they were trying, okay, I think I should go back to this because otherwise it will distract. Um, but the, the problem was that the organization wanted more of its host country nationals. So the people on the ground in Africa, in Asia, in South America, mm -hmm. instead of just being frontline workers, more mm -hmm. of them should become supervisors and managers within the care system. Mm -hmm. And so they developed a management development program. And what they wanted to do on the first day of the program, when they brought everybody, they brought like, uh, 25 people from all over the world brought mm -hmm. them together. They wanted to forge a community and a common culture among them. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to help them understand the culture of the care organization. Mm -hmm. So they started with a day of storytelling. And uh, they began with a th having a theater company, a local theater company, act out some care stories written by the people, the care employees who actually live them. Mm -hmm. So there was one from India mm -hmm. where the, uh, they set up a women's credit union. Uh, there was one from Sierra Leone where they started out with delivering seeds and tools, but they wound up creating a peace day which brought elders, women, and youth in the villages together to talk about mutual, mutual issues and how to solve them. Mm -hmm. uh, in Afghanistan, they, had, they wanted to provide food and fuel for women and children, but the Taliban, um, but men could not interact with women, women could not interact with men, and they, the Taliban said no women could have jobs. And so how could you have somebody distribute to the women or help them? Mm -hmm. And so this was, the story was, you know, how they listened and listened between the lines and uh, found that they could do single day contract for women workers as long as they didn't interact with the men. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all of it, 
some of these stories were really quite drastic. People were in great danger. When this Taliban story was, when this Afghanistan story was being told, a, um, the woman who was at that time the head of Care International disappeared off the streets of Kabul. And um, during, uh, during the program, people were worried about her. And on the third day of the program, her body was found in the street where she had been murdered. Um, and what they, what this did, um, I, I was very moved listening to these stories and then recording them and trying to draw them, um, was that it, it drew people into how important this was and how it, it took a great courage and great dedication to continue doing ordinary things under extraordinary circumstances. So during the remainder of the, the first day, all the participants were put in small groups to tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. And I went around and recorded as many as I could and uh, did them in picture form. By the end of that day, they were a community. They would have done anything for each other. Mm -hmm. And they also had each other's telephones and emails. And so somebody working in India could send a message to a colleague in South America and say, here's what I'm dealing with. What would you do? Mm -hmm. And they, that was the intent of this. Mm -hmm. And it succeeded. And that's what storytelling can do for you. Um, let's see. OK. Obviously, that was an example of drawing people out through storytelling. You can. Another way to draw people out is the use of picture cards, where you get a group that you want to talk about issues that are important to them. Um, you give them photographs to sort through a pile of cards. This is the photo jolts that uh, ISBI members put together, Glenn Hughes and Tiagi. And uh, each person is invited to take, uh, to select a picture that's meaningful to them in relation to the issue that the group is discussing. And then each person is asked to tell their story about why this, what this means to them and how it relates to the problem. And it, it breaks the ice. It draws people out. Let's see, okay. Uh, I also want to talk about fostering collaboration. Mm -hmm. So I use something I call, the vis call a visual template where, mm -hmm. where we want, this was from an ISBI conference actually, um, and one of the small conferences. What they wanted people to do was to plan how to get the most out of their conference. So mm -hmm. we had a, a um, plenary, a plenary session. Mm -hmm. And each person was given this placemat. Um, the organizers told me what questions they wanted people to address. What did you come here to find? Why is it important to you? Um, what nuggets have you found so far? What treasures have you found so far? What can you share with others? What do you still want to get? and how you organize yourself to get it. So they had 10 minutes and some colored felt pens. And this was the size of a placemat in front of them. And they were invited to write and draw on their placemat. And then the table was invited to share with each other what they had found, what they had learned, and to seek others' advice on what would be good sessions to go to or good people to meet in order to get the things that they wanted to get. So this started the conference off with some planning and mutual collaboration. Um, and then finally, and develop, uh, developing strategy. Um, oh, 
Okay. I do not include this in the slides because it is the intellectual property of the Grove Consultants. The Grove Consultants specialize in visual thinking and visual collaboration between people. They have a wonderful website full of tools they have developed and tested over the years. They provide trainings. They now do virtual trainings. It's a great resource. And it's the Grove Consultants International. Um, so this is a template like the one that I showed you we used as a placemat. But this is a wall template. It is, um, it's about one meter high and two meters wide. The facilitator puts it on the wall and then gets the group to form a half circle facing the wall close, close to them. And then the facilitator asks as a, as a start to the strategic planning process, let's look at where we are now. What are some, what is the context we are working in? What are some current trends that are important to our organization? What are some political factors we need to pay attention to? And as the group answers, they can write it in words, the facilitator can write it in words, they can add pictures, little symbols and icons. So what, what are, what's the economic climate we are operating on? What are some technology factors that we need to pay attention to. What are customer needs, particularly moving forward? What are some of the uncertainties that we have to deal with? When they've got all this filled in, they have a shared idea of the context in which they are operating. Now, if they jumped right into the strategic planning, different people would be thinking about, some are thinking about the trends, some are thinking about the economic factors, some are thinking about the customer needs, some are thinking about the political factors. And so they get into arguments with each other over what's important because they don't have a shared big picture, mm -hmm. a shared context. So this, as a great example of drawing people out, of fostering a collaboration, as well as strategy development. So the next issue then is how does it work and why? Okay, I've, I've given you some applications for visuals and I'm sure Please. many others will, will occur to you. Well, I just want to comment uh, before you go. Uh, I mean, this is I uh, I downloaded uh, all the uh, uh, PDF files you sent to me, and I I, I trying to see look into the details, and my my uh, most of them I've seen them, but uh, that one I didn't see. Uh, the the strategic the strategic map. General reflection. I've I've seen your work, uh, you know, for many many years, but this is. Wow, you know, I wished I had that capability while I was at, you know, previous works, previous jobs, and uh, so that I can communicate, I can, I can draw easily. Uh, I mean, I attended numerous trainings uh, in my career. Uh, those I remember are always the ones that give me visually attraction. Uh, I remember the uh, two sessions, one is in China, one is in the United States that um, uh, there's a woman, we were in Phoenix, actually, our, our, you know, <laughs> we were, our learning headquarter was in Phoenix. And uh, during one of those uh, performance improvements, uh, we, we were training, I mean, our company are training us as a performance consultant in 2001. And uh, one of the women, uh, she's a consultant, she came in and she draw. She drew the entire room with all of her. I mean, she is teaching and she's drawing. She's very busy for two days. And at the very end, we see everything. And at that time, I, you know, we were still using cameras with film rolls, you know, but it couldn't capture everything. But um, amazing, impressive. I remember easily communicated and uh and the the is so it make learning so easy and uh as a matter of fact when i was um when i mean kids in china i mean not only i mean throughout the world in japan and any everywhere 
comics books. We li- we we grew up with comics books, but when I real when we really grow up, they disappear. <laughs> they disappear. They the don't Japanese, appear. The Japanese I mean, com- manga. They they have grown up comic books called manga. Manga. M O N G A. M A N G A. Uh, manga. Yeah. Manga. And the um, they apparently you will see business persons on the subway reading their manga. Right. Right. But but I mean at work at specific works you know I my work at his work or her work I mean it's not I mean it's gone. All we're facing are dull and dry bullet points. Well, bring it back. (laughs) I know, I know. (laughs) Yeah, that's why we're having this session. It's so valuable because because when we had comic books, when we have visuals to communicate, I mean, there is one saying in both Chinese and English, a picture saves thousands of words. And when you can tell a story, I mean, this making presentation is all about uh, telling a story and make sense to people and make sense to people and people can buy in, they remember, they go back to their works and then apply it. And uh, using visual is such a, uh, can make the learning transfer from the classroom to the workplace so smoothly, it seems seamless most of the time. That's what I want to comment on. So it really helps. Please go on. And I'm fully joined to it. Okay. It's so attractive. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, one of your questions to me was, "Does yes. it work, and why?" And so, I want I want to move from the the uh, pleasure and enthusiasm that uh, pictures typically bring uh, to some of the the research that supports why this why this works. Um, I'm offering two right here. Um, You mentioned Robert Gagné. Um, There was a very, very good textbook that Gagné edited. Um, It was Lawrence Erlbaum Associates, and it was the 1987 edition. The subsequent editions did not have this excellent chapter in it. Um, and so I recommend finding this older book and looking at what it has to say. It's uh, Malcolm Fleming, a summarized research on, it's, it's uh, a chapter called Displays That Communicate. And he was looking into how do you get the message across? And um, he summarizes buckets of research. And while the research happened before 1987, the human brain has not changed since 1987. It is still good and valid research. And uh, I, I include the summary of research in the handout that I sent to you. Um, Then A larger, more recent book is Graphics for Learning, Evidence-Based Guidelines for Planning, Designing, and Evaluating Visuals in Training Materials by Ruth Clark and Chapita Lyons. So that, uh, this is the second edition. I don't know if she has tackled the third edition yet. Uh, So this will have very recent research Though I encourage people not to throw out research because it's old, Um, just keep looking at new research uh, because very solid work was was done back in the 60s and 70s and 80s on human learning and the use of visuals. So uh, I also included in the handout some current uh, research on, on um, not specifically learning, but on human performance improvement. How do visuals help people perform or help develop performance? Mm-hmm. And so uh, th- these are references I got from Dr. Richard Clark. Mm-hmm. And uh, one is on building trust in community. 
And what I've done is I've pulled out bullet points here on the burden of the, uh, of the article. Although there's a, there's a link to the article in the uh, bibliography. Um, then there's uh, supporting and suppressing learning. So here it is again. Uh, and this is from Ruth Clark and Richard Mayer's book on there's the fact that your working memory or what I think of as your brain's desktop. Right. It's where you can manipulate information and think about it. And it has only limited space on it. So if you put too much on the desktop, it falls off onto the floor, you lose sight of it. Um, so if you have irrelevant stimuli that they can distract the learner and give them cognitive overload. So some of the vision, some of the fancy videos that are done for learning that are very high in entertainment value. They have like a Flash Gordon uh, or uh, Star Wars kind of um, flashy moderate, uh, modern surface and lots of special effects and so on. That can distract people from the learning. So what you have to make sure, it's not that the special effects are bad, it's that they have to be there for the learning point. They cannot be there to go, oh, wow, and right. to raise people's heartbeat and excitement. Exactly. As long as they direct the person's attention to the learning, underscore the learning point, dramatize the learning points, then they're, they're a good resource. But be careful not to go overboard. Right. Um, so that's a summary of what um, uh, of what the remaining bullet points say. And then another one has to do with this, uh, establishing relationship. Now, I have the, the caveat here. This is about enhancing sales performance. It isn't necessarily about learning. But if you are training people to improve their sales performance, then these are things that can help you help improve sales performance. What I, a trainer would take, I would hope would take away from this is help salespeople understand the relevance of the, how important it is to tell stories as they do their sales, how important the relevance of the story is to how important it is to, that it's relevant to the listener and uh, that have some element of humor. And that it doesn't have to be light, likely. It doesn't have to be plausible story. It can be pure fantasy, as long as it's relevant to the, uh, to the buyer. And uh, it it's, can be positioned as something that happened to the teller themselves, but that's not as important. What's important is how relevant it is sales prospect and whether it has a sense of humor to engage them. Okay, so what if you can't draw? Right. That's my next well, question, actually. <laughs> can I do it? <laughs> how can you do it? Yes. Well, I love it. We love it. Here's what I recommend. And now I'm going to I want to go back to your desktop, George, so that people can see me. Yeah. Okay. That so you're, that's draw you're being mind. seen all the time, actually, where we. Yep. Okay. okay. Well, you're going you to wanna... need to be able. Uh, okay. So you want to get rid of the uh, screen sharing? So I use a graphic alphabet just as now I know a large part of my audience is Chinese, and you use a visual set of characters. So I don't know how relevant what I am saying. I, I think this is relevant to you if you think you can't draw. But some of my way of explaining may uh, be problematic. So George, you tell me. 
Uh, it's okay. Oh. No. Uh, okay. By the way, Chinese is uh, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, written language is um, the pictographical language. Yes. So it's originated from pictures. So. Yes. I guess you have a huge uh, several books about it. So. Actually, um, the uh, the Roman alphabet, which is what we use came originally from Phoenician alphabet, which was originally pictograms also, but mm. it's long, long ago become mm -hmm. abstracted mm -hmm. and connected to sounds. Okay, uh, I I'm, I'm prevent myself from going off on some scholarly journey. Um, what do I mean by a graphic alphabet? Well, what, <laughs> It is hard to ask a person to just jump to drawing right. um, without some kind of a, a superstructure, just as you wouldn't teach a child to write without teaching them how to form the letters. And to form, and I think even in uh, your pictographic writing, there are elements that then get built on right. to form right. other elements, strokes. complex it's elements. Strokes. Yeah, yep. right, exactly. So these are elements, they are little geometric shapes that I use to build much of what I do. I have shown you many examples that showed elaborate drawings, but you can do very, very simple things and people still understand it perfectly well. Um, so let's work with an example. Um, if I show you these shapes and I want to show I want to show a laptop. Which of these shapes should I use to start my drawing? You tell me, George. The I would say, well, uh, a square. Okay, a flat, yes, a square. A square, yeah. of course. Right. In fact, I'll elongate it a bit and make it a rectangle. Okay. Is it, excuse me, I'm drawing backwards. It will look a little crooked. No problem. Uh, so is it a, is a laptop yet? Oh, no. No. What does it need? Uh, it needs, uh, it needs a keyboard. And True. also I need to see the shape. You know, it's, it's a cubical shape. Well, do, does it re, do you really need to see the shape to know that it's a computer uh, to a laptop? Uh, is uh, um, I also need to see, well, there's a mouse, there's a keyboard. Hold on, okay, so bear with me. Let's do the keyboard. Do any of these shapes have some promise for being a keyboard? Yes, the, uh, the uh, parallelogram. Parallelogram, okay, yes, I agree with you. Okay, so here. Okay, would somebody looking at this know that it is a laptop? Oh yeah, no, no, it does. And then uh, need some dots to see to, to uh -huh. show that their their keys okay. are on, on top. Good. Of so, do I need to draw forty seven little keys on this? No. no, as you said, just some dots. And it will suggest the peop the person's mind will fill in the rest. Right, I'm I'm drawing on my notepad too. So. <laughs> Excellent, good. I hope all our viewers are doing the same thing. Okay, now as soon as you have something that a person looking at it would say, "Oh, that's a laptop." Stop. Yeah. It doesn't need to be shown in three dimensions. It doesn't need to have a mouse. It doesn't need to have any of those things. Yeah. If this is enough to get the idea across, stop right there. The rest, it just takes up your time. And if you don't execute it well, then it also takes up the learner's time while they try to figure out what it is. All right. So this is plenty. Yeah. Okay. How could I turn it into a computer crash? Computer crash. Maybe a point and aura. Yeah, probably a good idea. Okay, <laughs> and to be absolutely clear that people know what I'm talking about, 
or what I'm trying to show, I can write the word. So you don't want to give up words completely. Right. That I gave you. Very good. Okay. Um, one of the things in the chapter, the Gagne chapter on visuals is label the image that it right. uh, that you increase the probability that someone will interpret that the learners will interpret it correctly. Right. Okay, that doesn't mean write a paragraph, just right. one word, two words maybe, keywords. Mm -hmm. Right. That's enough. Okay, so if I want to draw a person, mm -hmm. I can. Oh, well, I, I was going to ask, but obviously I've already done it. Um, but to draw a person's face, you will notice that I am putting the features on the side right. or toward the bottom because a person doesn't really look like that. They are much more engaging if you do this and it gives you room to add some hair. Right. And it lets you have them communicate with each other. So you can do two little faces, the mouth open. And there you have some communication happening. happening. So I might draw an arrow which if this were bigger, I could label message. <laughs> and then I could draw another arrow and label it feedback or answer. And then I have diagrammed communication. Yes, excellent. <laughs> Isn't it fun? <laughs> okay, we're going to continue with people. Okay. Uh, so if I want to show a whole person, I do a circle. Okay. Uh, a con I'm going to make a star person. So instead of the top point of the star, I put a circle and then mm -hmm. I put the four, then I do a line underneath and I make this the four points of the star. I do, a, but I make it skinny and I make the ones for the legs long. So here is a star person. Excellent star person, perfect. Okay, <laughs> so if I have a star person, it's easier to see than a stick person. It has okay. more substance. I can put it on the ground by maybe putting uh, a little line for a shadow. That puts them on the surface. Now, how can I draw a team? Perfect. Okay, how can I make, how can I make this into a team? How many people do I need to make a team? Two or three, three. Okay, good. I was going to say if I do two, what have I got? You got a team. I've got a couple. Most people. Oh, you got a couple, people right? People as a couple. So if I want to turn it into a team, I add a third person. So. Now, here we are. Is this a team? Yes, they're a team. Yours is a team. I don't think mine is a team. They're separated by they're space. Separated. the gap in between, right? Okay, but I don't have a lot of time. So how can I join them together? 
Um, I had another person in between. I right. I can, it, yes, I can. And you know how to do that. So I'll show you another trick, which is. Oh, yeah, they're in the circle. Put them in a circle. <laughs> right. So that's really one of my shapes is an oval. Okay, perfect. So okay, now, now. How, how can I draw team support? Team support. Um, give them a hand or something, you know, to illustrate. Okay, good. Help. You're thinking right. Now, what, what rises at this point, and this is a key thing that you must, that it's important to think about. It's what do we mean by team support? Do right. we mean the, do we mean someone supporting the team? Do mm -hmm. we need the team, do we mean the team supporting something? Or do mm -hmm. we mean the team supporting each other? Right. So if we want the team, uh, if we want someone supporting the team, oh, okay, then I can put somebody down here supporting the team. Holding them. <laughs> uh, if the I plate. Want, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> if I want the team supporting something, then I'm doing this very quickly and because I don't want to take up a lot of time, but let's say that's three figures. And then I write, what is it that I, what is it that I want the team to support? Right. Um, so maybe it's the new product. <laughs> if I know what the new product is and it's visual, uh, I can do it visually, I will do it visually. Right. Otherwise I just put new product. And right. then if I want the team supporting each other, uh -huh. I do. Ah, that's acrobatics. Yes, they have to work together. Otherwise, then of course, the people tower will fall. I have to label the image. Support, right. Team, Team. support. So in each case, I do this. This I should label. I, should, I can't write upside down and backwards. Excuse me. No problem. Okay, there, I labeled that image to communication. Right. So it isn't communication of it's only one person talking to everyone else. It has right. to move back and forth. Right. Yeah. Now. Oh, this is what, easy. Yeah, it is easy. And the funny thing is that you, you start doing this and maybe people tease you a little bit. Right. But, but very quickly they got they understand they start understanding better what you right. are getting across right. and they've somebody often in the uh, somebody in your audience will often say let me right yeah <laughs> give them yeah. the pen yeah yeah uh, so here on the uh on the screen you have the al the graphic alphabet and then some possible shapes you can use i'm trying okay. to grab the books that uh ruth clark's books ah oh great yeah especially this one the uh the graphics for learning. learning she got yeah. a lot of content in that and also yes. and also grabbed your books too yeah one of oh. your books 
yeah, I forgot to mention it's even been that one's been translated into Chinese. It is. It is. Uh, when I interviewed, uh, when I had the uh, the the fifth se fifth session with uh, Roger Edison, uh, we mentioned that, and I also I want to show you the um, the comic books that I had, and uh, I, I want to show it's it's very relevant that the, this is the comic books that everybody in China knows it. Uh, it's called the Three Kingdoms of Asian Stories. The Three. It's Kingdoms. called what? Sorry, the what? The Three Kingdoms. Oh yes, okay. The Three Kingdoms. So it's ancient times, you know, uh, war stories, uh, masterpieces of Chinese culture, of Chinese uh -huh. literature, and also there are like comic books, like the, it's a set. It's like oh, sixty wow. of them. It's a sixty of them. How wonderful! Yeah, they're all comic books. I mean, Sangui uh -huh. and Yi uh, and. Uh, I want to show you this because I, when I was, I mean, almost every kid in China, they, we love this kind of a comic books, you know, uh -huh. you know, we, oh, we, we yes. love this kind of a comic books and because they're, 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 they're pictures and uh, with some uh, illustrations, I mean, some text uh, be beneath it. Uh -huh. I don't know if you can zoom in or you can, can you see it clearly? I, I, mean, I can't, I can, yes, yes. The zoom, zoom has needs to zoom. <laughs> uh, I can see it. Yeah, it's beautifully zoom illustrated. Needs, these are yeah, really zoom needs to zoom. These are really yeah. good professional illustrations. Right, right. I want and, I want uh, to make sure people understand they don't have to do at that level to be able to be useful. Exactly, that's my message too. Um, this is the comic books when when we grow up, call it Xiao Ren Shu in Chinese, but uh -huh. um, but um, when that what 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 I meant is when when we grow up, when we graduated, when we go to work, this type of illustrations disappear, disappear at workplaces. So mm -hmm. workplaces by default to us for a lifetime for like thirty years. I've been working for thirty years already to is is almost meaning like <laughs> almost meaning has to be dull and dry you know it's mm -hmm. it's serious it's, it's, it's a straight face meetings you know as there's, there's very little humor um you know residues <laughs> left in the in the boardroom meetings so right. so there's, a, there's almost non-humors no humors, no relaxation, no fun, uh, but serious. Um, um, most of the time, burdens, and so does learning. So does learning. So that's the the impression casted on our mind, on our brain, as yeah. an employee, as mm -hmm. a learner of uh, of a big organization or small of of any organization. So what if? What if? This type of visuals is part of your work. Yes. I mean, at least not not every company can afford to do that, can hire you or art artists to do this. But what if as some training sessions and we as trainers, we accomplish some of the basic skills of what you show us, some of, you know, what what are graphic alphabets? You know we can use them to compose to convey some simple ideas and to get some of the most complicated messages across the board. Yeah, it's and very it's, it's suddenly it's just like snap of a hand. It's just like like just like that. People get it, and guess what? You will create resonance among your audience right away. Immediately, because most of them are expecting this at work. Yeah. Not most of them, uh -huh. all of them are expecting this at work, but uh -huh. we don't have it. Yeah. So oh, that's fine at work. But what if learner, I mean, trainers, please, uh -huh. learning professionals in front of camera, I'm pleading. Yeah. <laughs> what if we bring some elements of pictures? fun we use some of simple graphics in our classrooms 
that we can draw. I'm 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 kind of regretting right now. I've been teaching many many workshops. I've been teaching. What if I could have acquired some of these? Looks like simple, but needs more practice to get per more perfect uh, skills in the classroom during my past 20 years of teaching, because I've started teaching about 20 years ago. Mm. That my that way my workshops would be would have become much, much more effective. So to the young learning professionals in front of my camera and al along, I mean, all the training manager training professionals, please learn something about this. This is a very, very, learn something that Lynn just demoed us. The graphics, the triangles, the shapes, you know, the circles, the stars, and the points and auras, and use some of those to convey, to get some complicated or even, you know, whatever you're teaching, concepts and skills and, you know, uh, definitions, whatever concepts you're teaching these will help you greatly and trust me on this because we have all been through this lynn have been through this lynn have seen this you for you probably um have seen this a lot a lot and uh, you're probably i mean lynn at every session that he, that attended uh, of your you, your workshop is like you're the star of you're the star of the, the ten, i mean you're the attention of all, everybody you're a star in the in the in the classroom and i bet to you i bet to you i promise you all the uh, learning professionals in, uh, listening to this listening to, to this right now you will become star teacher or star instructor or star presenter when you acquire this these basic skills, period. I promise you, because I've gone this. I've gone through this. I'm I'm still drawn to it. So, I mean, work should be fun. Life should be fun. Work is yeah. life. Life is learning. Learning is fun. <laughs> Amen. Please go on. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> It come back to you. So I just want to make a short comment okay. to, to our to our to our audiences. Well, I I agree with you, George, and I encourage people to look at to look at the serious side and the research, right. and and just know that not only is this fun, it is effective, and is. know why it is effective. And uh, fortunately, people like Ruth Clark. Uh, who others uh, and um, Gagne and um, poof, I'm forgetting the other man's name right now. At any rate, um, Richard who, Mayer, uh, who yes, who who will comb through the research. Well, Mayer's right. doing the research, right. and then we have people like Ruth, uh, who will comb through the research and bring out the fruit of the research for us in an understandable form. So this, it's very important to have that behind you. I, 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 have... I, I just want to comment, I really love her. I mean, I really love her work. I, I really love her as a person, uh, her personality, her work, her contribution is amazing to the field. And luckily last year, if you remember in New Orleans on the stage, I was presenting her the Lifetime Achievement Award to, yes. Ruth, uh, to Ruth Clark. I mean, that's a li yeah. lifetime honor to me. Yeah. Wanna... yeah. She... Amen. She's been a mentor to me, too. Um, okay. Well, wow. uh, one of your questions, George, was Does visual communication foster knowledge better or skill better? So, my, my my answer to that is that it facilitates both equally uh, by clarifying what, how, and why. And in the case of knowledge, it makes abstractions concrete. And it helps people to understand more quickly and to remember more clearly and longer. In the case of skills, it actually illustrates what to do and how to do it. And it can also dramatize the consequences of doing it poorly. Right. So it, uh, it really, really will help 
your learner in either circumstance, in both circumstances. And very often you can't really pick apart skills and knowledge. They need to knit together uh, so that people know not only what to do, but why they are doing it and what are the consequences. I want to uh, add a question. How much do you think uh, to, well, you have come a long way in your career to come to this level. How there is there accelerated speedy development of this kind of skills so for the learning professionals? I would say um, you, yeah, it's practice. It's just yeah. doing it. Yeah. Um, there are many resources out there. The Grove has uh, the Grove consultants, the ones who made the template. I've got the link to several of their templates in right. the um, in the handout. Um, they have books and resources on this. You can Google IFVP, the International Forum of Visual Practitioners. That is people who, primarily people who facilitate meetings mm -hmm. or who are graphic recorders for meetings. So what they do is create a visual record of what is being said in the meeting while it is being said. I have done this work myself. There are some examples of it on my website. Uh, and... Uh, the IFVP, there are many people in the IFVP who do courses, including online classes mm -hmm. in how to do this. So that can accelerate your meeting, uh, mm -hmm. your learning. Um, a, oh, my brain just went in two directions at once. Um, there's, I, I would recommend just uh, starting to play with these with this graphic alphabet and creating images and then looking out um, for cartooning and simple drawing on the web to get more ideas looking at the IFVP where you can look at the list of members and they have samples of their work and just start doodling during um, just turn your blank piece of paper this way Mm -hmm. and start doodling your notes, writing just keywords. There's something called sketch noting right. by a man named Ed, named Rhodey, R-H-O-D-E, um, who has materials on taking notes, taking personal notes in your notebook visually. And uh, that can really build your facility and stretch your imagination. And uh, the other is to keep in mind uh, my, my graphic mentor is David Sibbett, who was the founder of The Grove. And uh, I learned the, uh, the graphic alphabet from him. And uh, People trying to learn to do graphic recording and graphic facilitation would say to him, oh, David, I love this, but if only I had your talent. Right. And would say, this job is about 3% talent and 97% guts. By gut, and by guts, he means boldness and courage. The willingness to drive in there and just do it, just do it. and not worry about how you look. Huh? Especially easy to practice when you're just taking your own notes. And then, and then you'll find people leaning over and looking at what you're doing and then somebody saying, could I have a copy of your notes? <laughs> and then maybe you'll start feeling bold to do it on the flip chart during a trainer's meeting when you're recording what's being talked about. Yeah, that's, you can start small and move big. That's great advice. Thank you. Thank you. If you, uh, I, I want to, uh, I, I don't want to have too much of your time, but this, this is a great session. Oh gosh, I really like it. I mean, uh, this is a, so 
so much fun session. Most of the fun session, I mean, every session is is fun, but in different ways. And this is a uh, uh, too much, very much into drawings and uh, to my childhood hobbies and relate to it build build the, my deep long childhood hobby love to my current and future work. And this is what what is values. I mean, this session values. I mean, and, and graphic. Um, uh, visual communication. So I want to ask you as a closing uh, questions, I want to ask you two more. One is uh, if you had a chance to start all over again, what would you have done differently? Well, you know, George, I wouldn't have done a lot differently, but if I had the chance, the money and the time, I would go to an art school to train in graphic design and illustration. Not because I need these, that to be able to draw or to use it, but what it would do for me would enable me to be a better designer, to draw more accurately, to work faster, and to be more flexible in different media. But that's just my personal goals and preferences. It is quite unnecessary to be able to do this. Um, and uh, I would also look for training in human factors if, again, if time and money were no object, because right. that is a fascinating field that relates to human performance. And um, there is a man named William Horton, H-O-R-T-O-N. Oh, yeah. Okay, you know Bill Horton. Oh, yeah, Bill Horton. Horton. Yeah, well, he's a human factors man that does that particularly attends to visuals. And uh, he has done quite a number of books on that. Oh, yeah. His, and his e learning manual is always the thick, always yeah. book is like a big break. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, has, he goes to human factors conferences and harvests information that relates to um, instruction and um, and instructions, um, you know how to how to dis uh, how do I say it? How to create instructions that people can follow when they're doing a piece of using a piece of equipment, whatever, right. which is right. different from training. He's, he's also a master in in, uh, in 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 the in the e learning. And also, do you have these contacts by any chance in? I don't. I don't. Okay. Okay. I, I have some of his books and. Right. Right. I mean, okay. he's not on my list, on my wish list. So I'm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, as a as a closing statement, do you have any advice to the young practitioners in China and uh, any other development countries or people uh, practitioners in the United States and throughout the whole world? Okay. Well, you. You referred to developing countries, but I don't think China is a developing country. I think China has been very highly developed for thousands of years. Um, but my advice to any young practitioners, um, not going to be young practitioners, any new practitioners, including young Americans, it would be to get outside of your own circle of culture and experience uh, as soon as possible and learn to see the world as people in other locations and cultures see it. Um, that's the way other members of, uh, members of other nations and other cultures. If you can only see the world from your own perspective, you risk living with your head in a bucket. It's very important to right. expand outside what you were told from your youth, from your childhood is reality and right. see the incredible spectrum of realities that are out there and the different ways of looking at things and understanding things and the different ways of learning. I remember you, when you did the uh, self intro. You grew up in the uh, in the in in the uh, uh, in the lab uh, in the compound, and then there are so many PhDs around there, and but they're all from different diverse cultures. So from your childhood, you were brought up in a multi 
cultural environment and a yeah. uh, highly educated environment and um, a very safe, <laughs> secure <laughs> environment. Yeah, that and, was uh, nice. Yeah, but I of... also had the good fortune to go to um, to be a Peace Corps volunteer in a West African village. Africa. We were in West uh, in the Peace Corps for four years, most of the time in that village, part of the time in another. And uh, I, there is, there is no such thing in my mind as primitive people. Exactly. There, uh, there, there are. Le in the human race, there is great intelligence and many levels of sophistication. But if you come from one culture into another, you cannot see the levels of sophistication in the other culture until you have been around for a while. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. Yep. Yeah. I love it. I really love it. And thank you so much, Lynn, for giving us a suddenly open up another window uh and uh, and, and 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 uh, you yourself have illustrate illustrated that uh, how successful can be uh, i mean how success can be achieved also um being a performance consultant being a learning consultant and also being a thinker being a thinker and uh, just put your uh, your guts what in your words quote unquote a uh, guts into it, just do it and uh, practice, get the uh, right directions and uh, uh, keep focused and, 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 and uh, keep, sharpen, keep sharpening your skills and then you'll be good at, as good as Lynn. <laughs> You're very kind. And George, if you would like to do some webinars on how to do this, I would be happy to work with you on that. That'd be great. That'd be great. I think there will be a lot of people uh, who can, who can, we, let, let's do some, um, give us some time, give us yeah. some time and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask around, uh, especially on our audiences and if they want to do, and then we'll have some uh, webinars with you and that'd be great. I think a lot of people will be drawn to this after this, 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 uh, after this session. That'd be great. Thank you. We'll be in touch. We okay. will be in touch. <laughs> and last year we had uh, we we had a uh, we had a group dinner and uh, in New Orleans. And uh, next time, my treat. That was fun. <laughs> yeah. Thank Let's you, Lynn. Thank you so Let's much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. That's my interview with. Lynn Kearney, how do you feel? I feel like I just uh, got started. It's almost a two hours of interview. It was not like an interview, but more like a teaching session or a coaching session, a one-on-one -on -one to me. Actually, uh, when you're seeing this, uh, it is to all of you. And I really hope that you learn a lot and uh, you, uh, you, you also picked up a pen and start drawing while I was drawing. So um, I hope you learn too. And uh, now you see how important it is to use visual communication in our future and storytelling in our future works and or training classes. So thank you, Lynn Kearney. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you so much for all these years for your creation, career creativity, career, for your innovation and innovatively use uh, visual arts into performance consulting projects. And that is very, very innovative and really, really effective and efficient. Thank you again. We really hope that in the future we can have some webinars with you. That's the end of our interview. But next week, we are going to have another highway weight, again, figure on our show. Her name is Margot Murray. She was the president of ISPI about 30 plus years ago, about 34 years ago uh, in 1986 and 1987. She was a very, very senior member of the performance improvement community, international community. And she has been working in dozens of dozens of countries. Her focus, her focus of, uh, of study throughout the decades is mentoring 
Yes, mentoring. Coaching and mentoring are so popular in China right now. But what is mentoring? What is the difference between mentoring and coaching? How does it do? What is it different from the learning and development system? How do we collaborate? How do they collaborate with each other? What are the mentoring process? What benefits that does it create? What are the nuances that we need to take care of when implementing mentoring programs at organizations? All these questions are still on my mind, and I hope you will have a lot of questions about mentoring as well. So until next Wednesday, please stay tuned, stay well, and good night. Thank you, and good night.